Hello and welcome to Anton Math. Now in this video we're kicking off our discrete math series and in this first set of videos, this first section, uh, we're just going to be going over some of the basic properties of numbers um, and the basic properties of sets, you know, and it'll be a review for a lot of the people viewing this, these videos, um, but it's really just to get us all on the same page. We're going to be talking about a lot of things that I'll be referring to throughout this entire series of videos, and so we want to make sure to cover our bases and that we're all, you know, starting from the same place. So in this first video, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the concept of a set in mathematics. Right? Now, in English, we use the word set pretty commonly. Right? Uh, we could say, you know, a set of dishes or, or a furniture set or, you know, a set of DVDs. And all that we mean by set in English is, you know, a collection of objects. Collection of objects. Right? And that's all that we mean in mathematics as well. When we talk about a set in mathematics, we really just mean a collection of objects. Now, let's say I have a set of DVDs, and that set of DVDs is Indiana Jones. Right? So I have this set of Indiana Jones DVDs. Now, that set is not just a collection of arbitrary objects. Right? That set comes along with some kind of requirements. It comes with some specifications. And so we want a way to be able to define a set in mathematics kind of the same way that we define a set in English. Uh, in English, we always follow the word set with some kind of description or some kind of um, distinction about what it is that we're talking about. Now, in mathematics, we're going to use a little notation here. Uh, and let's say I have this set S, right? So this, this big capital S, I'm going to use this kind of as a variable, as a set. Now, usually when we have variables in math, uh, what we're used to doing is a variable just means a number that we don't know. But we can use variables for lots of different things. And in this case, I'm going to use this variable S to denote a collection of objects. Now, the way that I will define that collection of objects is I'm going to be using these big curly brackets, right? Now, anything that I put in this curly brackets is going to be an object in my set and and what we're going to call this from now on we're going to say is an element of my set so if there's if there's an object in this set s we're going to call that object an element of the set s so let's say that this set s has just some letters let's say it has the letters a b s t and k right They're not in alphabetical order but that's okay so this set has you know these five letters and each of these are elements of S. Now the way that we denote that we would say for example A and we do this little, it kind of looks like a, cur like a curved E doesn't it? And then my big S. Now what this means is A is an element of S or you know, a little shorter, A is in S. Okay, that's all that this little symbol means. This means that A is an element of the big set S. And whenever we have this element sign, the thing on the left is going to be an element, and the thing on the right is going to be a set containing that element. Right? This is a new notation probably for a lot of you. It means A is an element of S. Now, I've used letters here. Um, but commonly we'll have these sets that are numbers. Now let's say I have this set T, just to get a little more notation out of the way. Let's say I have this set T, and T contains just A, B, and K. Now we want to be able to compare T and S if possible. And in this case, notice that A, B, and K are in T, and they're also all in S. But I also have S and T in my set S that are not in my set big T, are they? So the way that we um, notate this, we say T, and we use this kind of, it's like a sideways cup, and say S. Okay, now what this means is, if I were to write this in English, this would say every element in T is also in S. 
Now note, it doesn't go the other way around, right? This doesn't mean that every element in S is also in T. This just means that if there's an element in T, it's also in S. Or we can write this in a logical notation. And what we would say is that X is in T. And we use this double barred arrow. Right, this double barred arrow means implies or implies that. Or you know, if you're reading this like an English sentence, this would say x is in t then or x is in t implies that. We would say x is in s. Right. So I've now replaced this whole sentence here with this very brief, very concise mathematical notation, this logic notation. Right. This means that if x is in t well then x is also an s, or x is in t implies that x is an s, right? Now I could also do this a different way without the implies, uh, we could use this with quantifiers. You use this kind of upside down a, this means for every, say x in t, x in s. So this reads the same way, it says for all x that are in t, those x are also in s, right? So it's, these are all equivalent ways of saying what this symbol right here means, okay? So now we have a little bit of notation. Uh, I want to give a couple of examples of sets and um, kind of introduce a couple of ways that we can express these sets. Well, let's just... Okay, so let's say I have this set s. And this set is equal to all integers between 1 and 25. All right? Now, using our set notation, there's a couple of ways that I can write this. Right, I can say s is equal to, and I want it, you know, this bracket to enclose all my elements, and then I can list them all. One, two, three, four. I'm going to put these three dots. That means I'm going to continue on in the same fashion, right? I'm going to follow this pattern, and then I'm going to finalize this 24, 25. Right? I didn't write them all because it's going to take a long time, but I mean, we can list them all, and you can see that gets kind of tedious, doesn't it? Especially when we start getting larger and larger sets. Now, when you start talking about sets that have hundreds and hundreds of things in them, well, that's just not going to be very practical, is it? So the other way that we can write a set is kind of like I was saying before uh, with my example of those Indiana Jones DVDs. If I have a set of Indiana Jones DVDs, well, that would be the set of all DVDs where those DVDs are Indiana Jones and they're in my house, right? So the way we kind of do that in the English language is we talk about something general and then we give it some kind of restriction. Now with these sets, that's going to be called a membership law. And here's the way that we're going to do that here. With this same set S, I can give a little, um, a little sample of what an element, a general element in S is going to look like. And then I'm going to put a line. Or we can also do this. Uh, sometimes it's done with these, this colon. Now this colon and this line are both used. You, know, you can use whichever one you're the most comfortable with. I, I prefer using this line. And how this basically reads so far is, um, S is the set of X, so S is the set of X, such that, okay, so it means such that. And now I'm going to put my, my membership laws, my restrictions, okay? So if I'm looking at all of the integers between 1 and 25, I can put, well, that's the same as X, such that X is an integer. And we're going to learn an easier way to write this statement in the next couple of videos. So x such that x is an integer, and I put a comma to put my next restriction, and I want to do a little inequality. 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 25. Now look, I didn't need to use any little dots. I didn't need to list out 25 different elements. This is actually a very nice, concise way to explain exactly what's in my set without having to just write every single one. All right, so this is just the exact same thing as this s up here. Now I could also write something like, you know, there's not one way to write a set. So x is an integer. And then I could write, you know, 0 less than x, less than 
26, right? That would be the same thing. Because x is an integer, I know it's not going to be anything between 0 and 1, so I'm not actually adding any elements by expanding this out because I've changed from less than or equals to to strictly less than, okay? So let's look at a couple, or let's look at another example. Let's say I have this set t. This t is equal to the two elements negative 1 and 1. Now in this case, right, there's only two elements. Whenever there's only two elements, or you know, a very small amount of elements, it's usually going to be easier just to list the elements, right? You can follow the KISS principle. I'll let you go ahead and, and Google what that means, KISS principle. <laughs> um, but you know, just for the sake of example, I could also write this as you know x such that x is integral, right? That means x is an integer. And um, you know, we need some additional restrictions on here, right? I'm not quite done. Well. I know x is between negative 1 and 1, but I still haven't limited it enough, right? We need to make sure that we're doing a, a complete limiting down to only the elements that we're talking about. And right now, with what I've written here, I also have 0 in my set, don't I? So we need to document that. x is not equal to 0. So we see this is kind of a, a another sided example. This form over here where we're giving these membership laws to define what's in the set is not always the best way to do it. When we have very small sets, it will still be easier just to list out the elements. And we always want to just do, you know, whatever the most simple way is to describe the set that we're talking about, right? Whatever takes the less amount of time to write out. That's usually what we're going to use. That's kind of the, the general rule that we follow. Now we can always get a little bit creative here. You know, negative one to one, negative one and one is still going to be shorter, but, you know, I could also write this as, you know, x such that x squared is equal to 1. Right? We know that x squared is equal to 1. That only has two solutions, 1 and negative 1. So this set is the same as this set is the set the same as this set. These are all equal to t, aren't they? OK, so that's just some of our basic sets, basic notations. Remember, we have these two notations. This means is in the set. And we also have this notation. This means subset, right? Um, what we did before, T is a subset of S. All right, now in the next video, I'm going to start going over some very important sets that we need to become familiar with, and it's going to really cut down on the amount of writing we need to do. It's going to really help us out to define these sets in the future, and we'll see you there.